me to the book of John, book of John. I want to share with you a few thoughts tonight out of the latter part of John chapter number one. I want us to be thinking tonight about our witness for Christ. Uh, we talk about witnessing and we talk about our testimonies and how important that they are. Uh, but uh, talking about it is not enough to have an impact upon this world we live in. And we want to pray the Lord would help us to be more effective in our witness. Now, when it comes to witness, we know that part of our witness is based upon how we act and how we react. That some people, they, uh, uh, their life doesn't match what their lips profess. Uh, that not only should we say it, but we should show it with our lives. There should be a demonstration. Uh, but there's more than just lifestyle evangelism. There needs to be a, a, a willingness for us to be able to tell somebody about Jesus with our own lips. We find that there's disciples in the book of John that are following Jesus and they're starting to line up behind him as he has spoken to their heart and given them opportunity. Uh, but we see that these things don't just happen. There's somebody telling somebody who's telling somebody and on and on. And I guarantee you tonight that all of us, somewhere along the line, somebody told us about Jesus. Yeah. Uh, let's all stand together. I want to begin reading tonight in John chapter number 1 and verse number 35. John chapter 1, verse number 35. In verse 35, the Word of God says again, The next day after John stood and two of his disciples, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he says, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and saw them following, and said, saith unto them, What seek ye? Uh, they said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say being interpreted, Master, where dwellest thou? He saith unto them, Come and see. They came and saw where he dwelt, and abode with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two which heard John speak, and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first findeth his own brother Simon, and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted, the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah, thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. The day following, Jesus would go forth into Galilee, and findeth Philip, saith unto him, Follow me. Now Philip was of Bethsaida, uh, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip findeth Nathanael, and saith unto him, We have found him, of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Uh, Philip saith unto him, Come and see. And we'll stop here tonight and we'll go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we're so blessed tonight to be able to have your word. Lord, that you give it unto us, Lord, tonight to be a, a light under our path. And Lord, that you use it to guard our hearts. And Lord, use it to instruct us. And Lord, uh, we pray tonight that we'd receive that instruction from heaven. Lord, we're all students, Lord, in your school. And Lord, we've been enrolled through the good grace, and Lord, of Almighty God. Lord, that you've called us in and saved us. And, Lord, we know that we haven't arrived yet. And, Lord, we want to grow. We want to produce more fruit for your glory. Lord, we want to have our roots deep. And, Lord, our witness be strong. Our light would be shining bright. And Lord, there's many that we are seeing on a daily basis that if they were to die, they'd go to hell because they've never been saved. And many, Lord, have never been saved because they don't understand what true salvation is. Lord, don't understand that you died for their sin. And, Lord, you paid away. Lord, I pray that you'd forgive us for where we fail you. Lord, I pray tonight and thank you for being long-suffering and merciful and gracious. And Lord, we pray in these next few moments that you give special liberty, that we might rightly divide your precious word. And we ask it in Jesus' precious and holy, lovely name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Often I talk about my pastor, and some of you probably feel like you might know my pastor because I mention him so often. Uh, but uh, just so special in my heart. Uh, but my pastor had a mentor also, and the mentor that he had was a man by the name of Dr. Percy Ray. And uh, Dr. Ray was, um, he was a, a unique individual. 
and never was married and had given his life a holy to the service of the Lord. And, and God used him in a tremendous way that he was one of those circuit preachers and he would preach in different churches and, and uh, go around and rotate and just uh, church after church. And, and uh, that the, the was without pastors and he uh, would uh, set up tent meetings and camp meetings and whatever the Lord would give him to do. But I remember uh, that uh, he would come to West Lenore whenever I was young, that he was on up in years. And he was one of those men that was a, a prayer warrior. And he didn't uh, just preach or teach about prayer, but he was one that engaged in praying. And there's times that he would go to Brother Lockie and he would tell him, say, can you open the church and I want to go up there and spend some time. And uh, they would be having a revival meeting, or we would be, and and uh, they uh, would somebody go up there till three o'clock in the morning, and Dr. Percy Ray would be stretched out on the altar praying all night long. Uh, there's times that you might would drive by one of the churches where he would go and preach at, and he'd be laying out there on the ground, flat on his face, in the the, the dew, praying and asking God to bless the services. But uh, uh, the after uh, he had went home to be with the Lord, there was a book written. I think, Brother Jerry, you've seen it before, maybe Brother Wayne, Brother Tex, maybe some of you have seen it, got it up at the camp meeting. Uh, but in that book, it kind of gave a highlight of uh, his life. It didn't exalt and lift him up because that would never be his desire. But it exalted and lifted up the Lord and how the how he saw the Lord work and souls that were saved and churches that were built and, and uh, just um, a tremendous moving of God. And uh, that book was instrumental because we read it and you see it and you say the same God that did those things then is the same God who's on the throne today. Well, my pastor, uh, he had told me uh, after Miss Lockie went home to be with the Lord, uh, Brother Lockie, I was talking to him on the phone one day and he was getting a little more weak than he had been and was not able to preach as often as he had been. And he told me, he said, Brother Todd, I want you to help me pray about something. He said, the Lord put it on my heart to uh, write down some things and he said I don't really even know how to go about it he said uh, but I just want to share some things that I have witnessed and experienced in my life and the hand of God moving and the mountains that's been moved and the prayers that's been answered and even the times whenever God didn't answer things the way we prayed about it to be answered that God gave grace and God gave strength and uh, even seeing uh, God uh, take uh, bad things and use them to get good results out of them and just wanted to testify to God. And uh, so I knew he started writing down some things, but the Lord called him home before he was able to get it all put together. But I talked to his son, Charles. His son, Charles, had said that he was trying to get all that put together. And I hope he does because it's important. But really, if it comes right down to it, if we uh, get down to where the rubber meets the road, that if there's anybody in this world that has something to tell, it's we that are saved by the grace of God. Those that live by faith, those that walk by faith, those that trust God to do the impossible and to move mountains, and uh, we could spend the rest of the night talking about the faithfulness of God and the goodness of God and the mighty works of God. And when we talk about the mighty works of God, we wouldn't just have to go back to the Bible and talk about what he did for uh, the children of Israel and delivering them from uh, the Egyptian bondage. Or we wouldn't just have to talk about uh, how God gave David victory over his giant. But we could talk about how God delivered us and how God's given us, or given us victory over our giants. How God's taken and he has parted and made a way for us to be able to go uh, through the circumstances of life. How God has taken little and used it to do much. And we could uh, testify and there's much that could be said that would give uh, the Lord honor and glory. Now, when I think about tonight and we come to the book of John, that the book of John begins with... Uh, the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ, John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Then we read on over, uh, and uh, verse number 14, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. But then notice in verse number 15, Verse 15 says, John bare witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And uh, we start looking at this, and we see, first of all, that there's the pointing to Jesus uh, as the, he's not just the Son of God, he's God the Son. 
that he is the word of God that was made flesh and dwelt among us, uh, the only begotten of the Father. And then we get on over and we start seeing uh, an introduction to uh, John the Baptist. And John the Baptist, we spoke about the other night, that he was the uh, one that Malachi prophesied of, that would be uh, the, uh, the one that would come and he would prepare the way. We've seen in the New Testament, in the book of Luke, we opened it up and we've seen how Zacharias is going through the, uh, the uh, uh, work of the priestly office and the angel stood by the right side of the altar and told him, he said, thy prayer has been heard and told him he's going to have a son, his name's going to be John and here's going to be his purpose. And we find all this is a fulfillment of God's word, uh, even from back that Malachi prophesied 400 years before it had ever taken place. Now, the purpose and the ministry of John was to be a witness and to be a light and to be that voice that would prepare the way, a voice crying in the wilderness and preparing the way uh, for Jesus to come. Now, John's, uh, he, uh, he, he was a, a different type individual, but God used him just the same. But we find when we get on over into the latter part of the book of John and these latter verses, we find that John's witness had been effective because there were some uh, that were coming to know Jesus as a result of John's faithfulness and a result of John's preaching and a re uh, result of John's uh, witness that he had uh, shared. Now, I want to look at these verses for just a few moments tonight and, and think about how this can be applied to us as we are witnesses for Christ just as well. First of all, we think about where our witness starts and how that it begins and uh, what uh, exactly a witness is. When we think about the word witness, we often are drawn to some familiar verses of Scripture and passages, and uh, sometimes during the missions conference, and we have our missionaries to come in, and some of them will preach on the Great Commission, and they'll go to the book of Matthew, and they'll go to the book of Acts, and, and when we go to the book of Acts, the passage of Scripture that we're familiar with is in the first chapter and verse number eight, and we know the Word of God says, but ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And we see that, uh, and uh, it starts out at home, and then it's, uh, it starts, uh, uh, the, the range begins to broaden, and before long, our witness is to be into all the parts of the world. Now, the only way tonight we're able to, to do that is through missions that we support and being effective throughout the whole world. But I'm thankful tonight uh, that First Baptist Church Okahumka uh, is a witness and has a witness uh, that we are able to, uh, by the grace of God, be able to send and to be able to support and to be able. Uh, but listen, our, 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 uh, when it comes to being a witness for God, it's more than just sending somebody else. When it comes to our missions, mission is more than just sending money overseas or uh, even here in the States, uh, that really when it comes down to it, we have a personal responsibility and a personal accountability. I remember one time that uh, we had an individual uh, that was a member of my home church, and uh, he had came to the pastor, and he told the pastor, he said, the Lord's put it on my heart to go to such and such country, and the pastor asked him, said, what do you plan to do when you get there? And he said, well, I'm going to be a witness. I'm going to go around and tell people about Jesus. And the pastor said, well, if that's what the Lord has told you to do, he said, then that's what you need to do. And he said, I'm all for, uh, for it. He said, but my question is, uh, what are you doing right here? Uh, who are you telling right here about Jesus? And the man said, what do you mean? And he said, well, if you're not willing to walk across the road and tell your neighbor about Jesus, uh, then why are you going to be willing to travel however many miles and tell somebody about Jesus? He said, I'm not saying you shouldn't. He said, but I'm saying that when it comes to our witness, it's not just about those out there, but it's those right around us and those across the road from us, but our witness is to be effective. And the only way it can be effective is for it to line up according to uh, the way God has laid it out in his word. Now, when we look at Acts chapter number one, verse number eight, or, uh, that we often put the emphasis on witnessing. Now, that is important. But you notice the Bible says, but after that the Holy Ghost has come upon, but after you, uh, shall, you, but you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses. The emphasis is not on doing, but the emphasis is on being. Not what we're to do, but what we are to become. Uh, here's the way that uh, we can say it that makes more sense. Is that before God will ever work through us, God must have the liberty to work in us. 
uh, that many times we try to, to do and to do and to do, but we haven't spent time with allowing God to, to do something in our hearts. So he's got to fill us up before he can pour us out. He's got to uh, show us something before we can share it to somebody else. Uh, you, we uh, looked in the book of Malachi the other night, and we found uh, that Malachi was instructed of the Lord to bring this message, and the message was seven announcements, and these announcements were harsh. I mean, they were hard. And every one of them was hard. And I shared with you that this was the time in which the temple had been rebuilt. The sacrifices were being offered. They were observing the feast and the fast. And what I'm saying is they were doing the things that they thought they were supposed to be doing, but their heart wasn't right with the Lord. Uh, you and I can go through the motions. We can do this and we can do this and we can do this. But the very most important part is not about what we are to do, but what we are to become. We talked about Jesus being the vine and we're the branches, or, or, or that he's the true vine and we're the branches, that without him we can do nothing. That abiding has so much, not just about bearing fruit, uh, but if we are to abide in him, that he'll help us to become what we are supposed to be. Did you know tonight that you can be a faithful tither and your heart not be right with God? You can be a faithful church member and your heart not be right with God. Uh, you can be a faithful witness and your heart not be right with God. Uh, we could go on and on and on about all the things we could do and our heart not be right. But I'll tell you this, if our heart is right with God and we are becoming what he'd have us to be, that we'll automatically want to witness. We'll automatically want to be faithful. We'll automatically want to give. We'll automatically want to be involved. What I'm saying tonight is you can do without being, but you can't be without doing that's why it's important that we let God become, help us to become what he'd have us to. Now, when we look at this, the word witness is somebody who testifies of what they have experienced. A first-hand experience, their own experience. You can't be a faithful witness or an effective witness if you're trying to share something that you don't really know anything about. Now, over this last few weeks, I have seen so many car wrecks. It has just about made me not even want to drive anymore. I'm talking about everywhere I go, I'm talking about bad wrecks, seeing the helicopters coming in to rescue and all this stuff everywhere. And most of the time, it's between here and the house. Uh, I left the other day, and I, uh, on the way to church, uh, that I seen three accidents, uh, and they were all pretty bad ones. And there was, uh, I met uh, emergency of, uh, vehicles uh, passed by my driveway going down to something that happened that way. There's at least four things happened uh, before I even got here to church. But, you know, and whenever something like that happens, the first thing that the cops do when they get there after they check on everybody is they say, who can tell me what happened here? Uh, that somebody might see it from their perspective or somebody else. But can you imagine if somebody comes up to the officer and said, hey, I wasn't here, uh, but that lady that drove off, she told me that man that was standing over here, I uh, told her that this is what's happened. I, I doubt that law enforcement would even want to take it and write that down. And what he'd say was, were you here? Did you see it happen? Uh, did you hear anything? Uh, what did you experience? Can you tell me from your own lips what you saw, what you heard, what you experienced? Because that's what I'm interested in. When it comes to a witness tonight, that you and I can't be effective witnesses for Christ if we haven't experienced some things of Christ in our own life. Uh, there's two witnesses in this passage. One is a man by the name of Andrew, and the other uh, is one by the name of Philip. Both of these became witnesses for Christ, but only after they encountered Jesus for themselves. Before they ever became effective witnesses at this, first of all, they had to have a revelation of Jesus and who he was. You know, a lot of people today don't even realize who Jesus is. Uh, there's all these things that come on, especially around Easter and Christmas and and this National Geographic and all this stuff put out this. And uh, they, the question is, who is Jesus? And they start going around to all these different religious groups and all these different people and say, uh, tell me, in your opinion, who's Jesus? Some of them say, well, he was a good man. Uh, some say, well, he was a good teacher. Some say, well, he was a prophet. Some say he was that. Some, some say he was a, an imposter. Some say he was a blasphemer. Uh, some say he was sin of the devil. I mean, all kind of things like that. You can find it in the Word of God. They said the same thing about him then. Some claim that he was a liar. Some claim he was a lunatic. And some said, no, he's the Lord. And so we got to know who is Jesus. That's why whenever Jesus had those disciples up there, he said, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, well, some say this and some say this and some. Th he said, but whom 
do you say that I am? Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. The Lord said, Peter, flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you. He said, but my Father in heaven did. He said, you know, I'm glad, thank God tonight, I know who he is. And the reason I know who he is is not because, just because somebody told me. I'm, I'm glad I know who he is because he has revealed himself in his word. And the Holy Spirit has made him known. And I'm glad, thank God, we've had the testimony of heaven uh, that the Father hath made known. The Holy Spirit uh, let us know that, thank God, he is the one. And he is, praise God, a wonderful teacher, best teacher ever was, but he's more than just a teacher. Uh, he's the greatest prophet there ever was, but he's more than just a prophet. Uh, he is, he's everything and so much more. He can't be limited just to something. He's everything tonight. Whenever we think about this, uh, John was proclaiming Jesus. John had some disciples, and he's telling them about Jesus, that he's coming. You better get ready. He's coming. And he's telling them all about Jesus. But then one day, praise the Lord, he showed up. And when John had been preaching and John had been teaching and John had been witnessing, uh, that one day John looks up and he says, Behold, the Lamb of God. And we read on other passages where he said, The Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. But here it says, Behold, the Lamb of God. You know what John's saying? John said, That's him. That's the one I've been telling you about. That's the one I've been preaching about. Uh, that's the one I've been trying to get you ready for. That thank God he's here. That's him. Now whenever he does this and he points to Jesus, that two of these disciples, they start following the Lord Jesus. Uh, one of those was Andrew. And uh, Andrew, uh, he starts following after he heard the witness of John the Baptist. And then later we find that Andrew, that he also becomes a witness and he witnesses unto his brother Peter. Uh, but before Andrew ever witnessed to Peter, he had to first of all know that Jesus was the one. And the way he found out that Jesus was the one is because John pointed him in that direction. Now when I thought about this tonight, I guarantee you that everybody in here at some point or another, that somebody pointed us to Jesus. Whether it was a preacher, a Sunday school teacher, a faithful mom or dad or grandparent, a family member, a next door neighbor, a co-worker. And in your mind, you might be like myself trying to think about when's the first time I ever heard about Jesus. I can't go back because I was always taught about Jesus. I mean, uh, from the very infant stages all the way up, mama uh, told me about Jesus and sang uh, uh, songs and uh, took me to church and, and I was always exposed to the truth but we have a missions conference and some of these missionaries come around and some of them been uh, born in countries where they're involved in Hinduism and Buddhism and, and all kinds of different isms and all kind of different religions and some of them had never even heard the name of Jesus until one day somebody told them about Jesus now when those missionaries come around they can tell you uh, that preacher so-and-so, that missionary, or they can tell you that that person is the one that told me. For them, it's a little bit easier. But I guarantee you that somewhere along the way that somebody told somebody who told somebody. But telling them, when John said that's him, that wasn't enough for them to know Jesus as their own Savior. Uh, that was enough to cause them to begin to follow him. But there's more than just a revelation of who he is. There has to be a relationship with him. Now note Andrew and the other disciple of John were, uh, they started following Jesus. Verse number 38. Uh, then Jesus turned and saw them following and saith unto them, he turned around and saw these two disciples, he saith unto them, uh, he said, what seek ye? And they said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say being interpreted, Master, where dwellest thou? I, I, they, they could ask anything. That they, they didn't know what to say. They want to say, where do you live? Where did you come from? We want to know more about you. Really what they're asking is we want to know some personal information about you. Where do you live? You ever had somebody that starts asking you personal questions long before it's time for them to be asking you personal questions? I mean, when you get to be a friend with somebody, you get to learn somebody, then you can start getting a little bit more personal. But if somebody come up to me uh, out of the blue and ask me where I live at, I'd say, why do you want to know where I live? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But really what they wanted was they wanted some personal, firsthand information from God himself. I tell you, that's what I need, is I don't need secondhand information. I want to know from God himself. 
some things about the Lord and thank God he wants to share it with us. And he wants to, uh, to tell us and he wants to, to help us. Uh, but uh, uh, when I, I think about this, that he wanted to know personally. Now notice what happens here uh, that uh, the Lord, he said unto them, he said, come and see. They came and saw where he dwelt. But not only did they come to see where he dwelt and then they left. No, they abode with him that day. So they was with him all day long. Now, I can imagine that during the course of the day that they learned a whole lot more about Jesus than just where he laid at, where he laid his head down, where he dwelt. They began to find out because the Lord began to reveal some things. Now, when I think about this, uh, that uh, they come to know him personally, a personal experience, spent time with him, reminds me tonight that there's a difference between information and intimacy. You can know about God, but not know God. Uh, you can have a head knowledge about God, but not have a heart knowledge about God. Uh, you can have a factual knowledge about God, but not have actual knowledge about God. But buddy, if you ever really get to know him, if you ever really get to know him, they won't anybody ever be able to change your mind about him. Amen. I thought about uh, over in the book of 1 John uh, that listen to this. 1 John, verse number 1, he said, That which was from the beginning which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we've seen it. Now he's talking about Jesus, and we've heard him with our ears. We've seen him with our eyes. We've looked upon him. We've handled him. He said, We bear witness, a bear witness. We bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and manifested unto us. Listen to verse 3. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that ye also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son Jesus Christ and these things write we unto you that your joy may be full. Uh, John saying, listen, what I'm about to tell you that I have experienced. I've seen him. I've heard him. I've handled him. That I've been with him. He's with us and he said that I want you to know what we've experienced because I in return want you to be able to experience the very same thing for yourselves. That's what a witness is. A witness is one that proclaims what they have experienced in regards to maybe somebody else experiencing for their own. But John said it's not secondhand information, it's firsthand knowledge. Not only where our witness starts, it starts with a revelation of who he is and then it starts uh, with a relationship with him, have to have that relationship with him. Uh, but then we notice that who our witness seeks. Now, in the text, we find Andrew and Philip, they met Jesus personally. We find in Philip's case, down in verse number 43, the day following Jesus would go forth into Galilee and findeth Philip and saith unto him, follow me. Now, based on a personal knowledge of Jesus, these two men uh, they sought to share what they had experienced themselves. Uh, they went out and they found some other individuals. They want to share what they've experienced. Uh, there would come a time that they would preach to everybody everywhere. Now, when it come down to it, the Lord would use them, and they'd be out there preaching and uh, all kind of Jews and Greeks and people everywhere, and, and uh, they'd be preaching to groups and crowds. But before it ever came to that stage, it started with a one-on-one -on -one personal witness and evangelism. You know, it's interesting to me, when I study the life of Christ, there's many times the Lord preached and taught to crowds. But think about how many times that it was a one-on-one -on -one personal encounter. I must needs go through Samaria. It goes over there to uh, Gadara, and there's that uh, maniac, and uh, he's a uh, uh, demon-possessed. And you know that all we know in the Word of God is the Lord went there and healed him, and we don't find anything else. And I think in my mind that the only reason Jesus went there was because of him. Aren't you glad tonight he's interested in individuals? The whosoevers, but it's more to him than just a whosoever. He knows us by name. He told Nathaniel, he said, that I saw you when you was under the fig tree. You know, I think about tonight. The Lord knew us before we were ever conceived. He knew the number of hair that'd be upon our head. He knew our shortcomings and failures. He knew everything about us, but yet he still loved us. And yet he was still willing to die for us. But it's more than just 
Uh, it comes down to a personal. Uh, somebody said, if you'd have been the only person on the face of the earth, that Jesus would have died just for you. And I'll tell you, he would have. He would have done just that. But what I find here uh, that uh, the Great Commission is to go into all the world, but it starts with those that are around us. Our Jerusalem, then Judea, then Samaria, and then the uttermost part uh, of the earth. But as we consider Andrew and Philip, that we learn some things about their outreach and some things about their witness. Uh, first of all, notice uh, in verse number 41, we find that there's some things going on here with Andrew. Uh, one, of the, one of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Verse number 41 says, He first findeth his own brother Simon, and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, which has been interpreted uh, the Christ. He goes to his own brother. His priority for him, he said, I've got to get to my brother. I've got to tell him. I've got to tell Peter that we have found him. And you know when it comes right down to it, uh, that there's people that we're connected to that we ought to be concerned about. Our family, our friends, those that we don't have to try to build a relationship, but we already have that connection. Now, I understand tonight that sometimes the hardest people to reach are those that are the closest to us. Why is it? Because some of them knew us before and even after salvation. But yet we still have something to share with them. But sometimes it's hard. Sometimes somebody says, if I go and try to witness to my parents, they're going to disown me because they didn't raise me this way. And, somebody, and, and on and on and on. But those that we're connected to, I wonder tonight if there's anybody that we're connected to, family or friends, that the Lord may nudge our heart to go and to tell them one more time about him. And that's what he does. He goes and he, he first. Uh, Andrew's always bringing somebody to the Lord. We find here he's bringing his brother Peter. Uh, we find on another occasion he's bringing the lad with the loaves and the fishes. We find another occasion he's bringing the Greeks who wanted to see Jesus. We need to be more like Andrew, always bringing somebody to Jesus. We find Philip, uh, his, uh, his situation was similar, but yet there was a little bit uh, something different here that I want to share with you. Uh, that Peter, uh, Andrew, he first goes to those that he's connected to. He first finds his brother uh, Peter. Uh, but when we look at uh, uh, we look here at Philip, notice in verse number 43, the day following Jesus would go forth into Galilee and findeth Philip and saith unto him, Follow me. Now Philip was of uh, Beth Bethesda, uh, the city of Andrew and, and Peter. Uh, Philip findeth Nathanael and said unto him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Now we don't know exactly what the connection was between uh, when, when we look here and think about uh, uh, Philip and Nathaniel, we don't know exactly how they were connected. But I'll tell you this, some reason, for some reason, Philip says, you know, this is the best thing ever happened, and I have got to find Nathaniel and tell Nathaniel what we have experienced. I don't know if they were friends from way, way back, I don't know if they were neighbors at some point. I don't know how they're related, but somehow there's a connection. I wonder tonight if there's anybody that we ever have a connection with that the Lord may lay upon our heart to go and to tell them about him. I think I shared this with you one time that uh, when I was at Laurel Hill Baptist Church, I was down the fellowship hall one night. We was having a, uh, a thing after church, and, and it was just a, a happy, eventful time. And, and uh, there was a, a man there that he was a, one of the church members that when he came there that he had been battling with uh, drugs and all kind of different things and and uh, he was addicted to pain prescriptions and and couldn't get freed and God saved him and God delivered him and buddy he got on fire for the Lord later on God called him to preach but he was on fire for the Lord and and I looked over he's always happy and, and and I looked over and he was sitting at the table and he had his face planted in his hands and he was sitting there crying and I go over there and I sit down and I said, Butch, I said, is there something that I can help you pray about? Something going on here? I said, I'm not trying to pry in your business, but I can say you're upset and I just want to pray with you. He said, I'm sitting here thinking about what a wonderful time we're having and how good God's been to me and what the Lord's done for me. And he said, I've got a friend from way back years ago. He said, we was partners in crime. And he said, I just found out that he's eat up with cancer and he's on his deathbed and he's dying. And he said uh, that uh, unless he's changed, he's on his way to hell. And he said, I, I, I can't stand the thought of him dying and going to hell, and God's been so good to me. And he said, I'd love to see him saved, he said, but I know it's too late for him. 
And I said, what do you mean too late for him? He said, well, I've always heard my whole life that nobody could ever be saved on their deathbed. I said, well, I don't know where you heard that, but wherever you heard it from, it's not accurate. I said, because when it comes down to it, every single person that's ever been saved were on their deathbed. All of us were on our deathbed. Dead in trespass and sin, uh, on our way to hell, just a, a step away from the grave. I said uh, that uh, there's nobody, until they've taken that last breath, nobody is beyond the reach of God. He said, I sure would like to see him saved. And I said, why don't you go talk to him? And he said, I want to. He said, but I don't know exactly what to say. He said, I know him. He said, he's always hated anything to do with God. He's hated anybody that ever come and talked to him about God. He said uh, that he'll probably cuss me out and all this stuff. And uh, I said, you know, I said, it'd be better for uh, him to be mad at you going to the grave after you've told him the truth than for you never to tell him the truth and never give him the opportunity to accept the Lord. I said, I'll help you pray about it. So I started praying with him. He called me up and he said, Pastor, he said, the Lord's told me I've got to go talk to him. He said, but I want to see if you'll go with me. And I said, sure, I'll go with you. I said, where's he at? He said, he's up in Asheville, North Carolina. It was about an hour and 15 minutes from the house. And I said, I'll come by and pick you up. We'll go up there. And I said, you talk to him. And if you need me, I said, I'll be there. I said, but you just tell him what's on your heart. And so I said, tell him what God done for you. So we got in a vehicle and we drive all the way up to Asheville and we get up there and I said, where do we go? Where does he live? He said, I don't have a clue. And I said, how are we going to find him? He said, well, he said, I've got a connection that, uh, that uh, was, uh, this number I've had my, uh, for years. He said, Let's, we'll call it up. So we got the phone out and we called it and disconnected. I said, do you know anybody else we can call? He said, no. And uh, he said, wait a minute. One, he called one more person and they, it was a dead end. And I said, well, what are we going to do? He said, I don't know. I said, well, I don't think the Lord would bring us up here this far with you having this heavy burden on your heart to turn around and go back home just like we came. I said, let's start praying. We started praying and we prayed and we prayed and we got done praying. And I said, well, I said, hey, you got anything? He said, no. He said, but let's go see if we can find a pay phone somewhere. And I said, well, I got a cell phone. He said, no, I need a phone book. So we drive and we go and we find, we finally found, uh, and I didn't know they still existed. We found a, a pay phone and he got out the, uh, the book and, and uh, he uh, got through it and he started turning and he got a, found a name and we called it up and dead in. Found another name, called it up and he made three or four phone calls and finally he said, I think I've got it. And he comes back with an address wrote down. I had no idea if we was ever going to see this man or not. We drove back in the middle of nowhere up this little alley and we got up there and we knock on the door and this little frail man he comes to the door and he's on a walker he can't hold himself up and there's a oxygen line running all the way back in the house he don't hardly have enough breath to even say come in he recognized butch and he lit up and uh, butch said can we come in and talk to you and he said sure we went in there and, and he uh, butch started pouring out his heart he told him he said i i know you know where you stood i know and uh, he said, I know that you don't have much time left. And he said, I wouldn't be a friend to you if I didn't come tell you about Jesus. He said, would you just please let me talk to you just a few minutes? And he started pouring out his heart, telling him about how God saved him, how God changed him, what God done, and on and on and on. And, uh, and the man broke down and started weeping. And Butch asked him, he said, if you were to die today, where are you go?" He said, but you know me. I haven't changed. He said, I'm, I'm on my way to hell. He said, there's nothing I can do about it. I said, you're right. There's nothing you can do about it, but there's something Jesus has done about it, and he'll save you if you want to be saved. And uh, he said, I want to be saved. And I took the Bible out, and I shared him Bible verses, and he uh, asked God to save him. And that man lit up, and a few days later, his sister called, and he said, and she asked Butch, said, uh, she got Butch's number from him, and she called Butch, and she said, what happened to my brother? And she said, what do you mean? She said, he called me and told me to go to town and get him a Bible. And I went and got him a Bible, and she, he had me to put his radio on a gospel station, and he's watching preachers on the TV and all this stuff. And she said, I've never seen him like this before. I'm going to tell you, God changed his heart. That wasn't long till he went home to be with the Lord. But I'll tell you this, there's people that we're connected to and people that we're concerned about, and it needs to be more than just concern. We need to go a step further and tell them about the Lord. Uh, there was a, I'm not even going to get to finish the message, but I'm going to tell you this right quick. There was a, a young salesman, and he got a job at a car dealership. And uh, 
he, he had the smooth talk, buddy. Somebody come by just looking before they knew it, they was going to sign the dotted line. And he uh, took it. He just knew he's going to be the best salesman ever had. They, he came to his manager, and he was real down and out. His manager said, what happened? And he said, I don't know what happened. He said, I thought I had a done deal. He said, all it lacked was just the signing on the dotted line. He said, the man got in it, and he drove off. And he said, I don't know what happened. And he was discouraged, and here's what he told his manager. He said, that just goes to show you that you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. And the manager said, that's where you go wrong. He said, your job's not to make somebody drink. He said, your job is to make them thirsty to where they want to drink. And you know when it comes down to it tonight, that our job's not to make somebody pray. Our job is to present Jesus in such a way that they'll want to know him as their personal Savior. And then we can share with them that here's how you can be saved. Uh, whenever, they, uh, whenever he went to Nathaniel, you know what Nathaniel said? Nathaniel said, uh, well, he said, we found him. Both of them had the same testimony. We have found him. This is him. He's the one. This is the Messiah. This is the anointed one. This is the one we've been waiting for. They didn't say, we think we found him. We're pretty sure he's the one. No, they said, we have found him. There's no doubt whatsoever. He is the one. Can I say thank God tonight whenever I share Jesus Christ, I don't have to share it with reluctance saying I'm pretty sure yeah. that he's him. I'm pretty sure this word's accurate. Pretty sure I'm on my way to heaven. No, I can say thank God he is the one. He's the one. He's the Savior. How do you know? Because he saved this old wretched sinner. He's the deliverer. He's everything. But when it came to Nathaniel, Nathaniel, Peter, he, he, Peter's pretty easy. But when Philip went to Nathaniel, Nathaniel said, can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? You know what Philip said? Philip didn't say, sit down, let me tell you all about it. Philip said, why don't you just follow me and see for yourself? Why don't you just come see for yourself? Do you know tonight, you and I, we don't have to try to convince people and twist their arm and everything. All we have to do is point to Jesus. Share the gospel. The Holy Spirit does the convicting. The Holy Spirit does the convincing. And the Holy Spirit does the converting. Salvation is of the Lord. Sometimes all we need to do is share our testimony, share the word of God. And somebody said, well, I don't know if all this is true or not. I say, well, why don't you just come and see for yourself? If you ever experience him for yourself, there'll be no doubt. By the way, how in the world can you explain somebody as wonderful as him? I can't explain salvation, how wonderful it is. All I say is you've got to experience him for yourself. And if you ever experience him for yourself, I guarantee you there'll be somebody that you care about that you'll want to experience him just as well. Amen. There's folk we need to be folk we need to be praying and asking God to save. And there's those tonight we need to be sharing.